You're watching a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Vacation time. There's never a shortage of South Dakota recreation. Got it? Hey, good job. Probably none of these vacationers are thinking about these two facts, but they're important to know. First, tourism, hosting visitors, is South Dakota's second biggest moneymaker, ranking only behind agriculture. Second, while lots of Americans consider vacation time essential, that wasn't always the case. Back in the 1800s, vacation travel was something mostly reserved for the wealthy. That changed when American workers organized and sometimes talked and sometimes fought with employers to limit work time per week to 40 hours. In other words, usually eight hours a day for five days, creating what we call the weekend, time for relaxation. Over the years, more and more factories and other workplaces granted employees a week or two of vacation time each year. Railroads took notice and began promoting places to visit. Hot Springs was one of those destinations. Starting in 1892, trains delivered people seeking relaxation, and in many cases healing, in natural hot water spas. Hotel Spring. In addition to warm baths and pools, a Hot Springs Commercial Club brochure spoke of Black Hills Air that sends the blood hurrying through your veins. It makes you hungry, eager to climb mountains, to walk, to bathe, to dance, to do everything and anything that is good for you. Next to the healing waters, it is the one thing that more than any other makes the weak strong and the strong stronger. About the same time Hot Springs started promoting its water and air, Mitchell began drawing train loads of visitors wanting to see one of America's most unusual buildings, the Corn Palace. Wonderfully detailed art designs of corn, other grains, and grasses decorated the buildings outside. While inside, the biggest entertainers of the time performed, including famous composer and bandleader John Philip Sousa. Still, the Corn Palace wasn't the biggest attraction on the eastern South Dakota prairies. That distinction went to this bird, the ring-necked pheasant, eagerly stalked by hunters from around the world. In fact, pheasants are the very symbol of South Dakota in many visitors' eyes. Ring-necks were imported from China, first by private citizens in the 1890s. The State Game, Fish, and Parks Department began releasing pheasants in 1911. And there's another creature that's brought lots of visitors to South Dakota, but didn't live here until introduced by humans. 
The Black Hills settlers of the 1870s and 1880s noted swift, cold, clear streams that were perfect for trout and full of natural trout foods. The only thing missing was the trout itself. Biologists at a United States government fish hatchery in Spearfish and later at a state hatchery in Rapid City changed that. Using milk cans like these, they put finger-sized baby trout into Black Hill streams. The trout grew and lured fishermen from all over. Among those to pull trout from South Dakota creeks was the President of the United States, Calvin Coolidge. In the summer of 1927, the President spent three months amid deer, elk, and bison in Custer State Park. His visit did a lot to make Americans aware of the Black Hills. He spoke at a ceremony that marked the start of blasting and carving on this mountain, a mountain that, 14 years later, would look like this. The sculptor, Gutzon Borglum, came to South Dakota because tourism promoters hoped he would carve granite spires in the Black Hills into statues representing Old West heroes. Borglum suggested carving the great granite cap of Mount Rushmore instead, and he liked the idea of presidents. With money mostly obtained in Washington, D.C. by South Dakota senators and representatives, and with the help of 400 workers, Borglum created not just a tourism destination, but one of the United States' most powerful symbols. Even before the last carving work on Rushmore in 1941, visitors were coming to South Dakota to see it, less and less by train, and more and more by car. But car trips in the 1930s weren't like they are today. Roads were unpaved and dusty. There was no air conditioning. In 1936, Dorothy and Ted Husted guessed that hot travelers would consider stopping by their drugstore and wall for free ice water if they put up a few signs along Route 16A. Their hunch proved right, and most people bought a few items in addition to drinking water. Before long, the little drugstore was anything but little. Today, Dorothy and Ted's grandsons run Wall Drug, and their signs are found all around the world. Today, South Dakota's travelers can come by plane, but most arrive on our highways in cars, motorhomes and buses, and on motorcycles. Every August, hundreds of thousands of motorcycles come to a world-famous rally at Sturgis. While Interstate 29, running north and south, and Interstate 90, running east and west, are the highways most South Dakotans think about when planning to cross the state, there are other routes to consider. For example, the Oyate Trail, links historic Yankton, Missouri River sites, and something lots of travelers to South Dakota want to find, our American Indian culture, especially vibrant on our reservations. A little to the north, Highway 14 is the Black and Yellow Trail, 
established in the 1920s to bring visitors west from Chicago to the Black Hills and Yellowstone Park. The Black and Yellow Trail passes through Brookings, the State Fair City of Huron, past the state capital in Pierre, and over the Missouri River and into West River Prairie Country before reaching the Black Hills. There are always new reasons for tourists to come to South Dakota. In 1998, another face carved into a mountain was unveiled, that of Crazy Horse, part of a vast mountain sculpture created to honor all American Indians. Korzak Zulkowski started carving in 1947, and his family continues the work today. In recent years, tourism leaders have promoted the notion of visiting South Dakota not just in summer, but into the fall and winter. And even with new attractions, visitors don't seem tired of the old. Big name stars still play the Corn Palace. Up to three million folks visit Mount Rushmore each year. History. And the splendor of our state and national parks and monuments are always draws. Pheasants still fly. Trout are still stocked in Black Hills waters. As are walleye, pike, and other fish in the great reservoirs behind the Missouri River dams. Of course, as most South Dakota kids know, you don't have to be from out of state to be a tourist here. And you don't have to be an adult to work in tourism. Because so much of it happens in summer, lots of South Dakota young people get their first jobs as hosts to our travelers. For additional information, a teacher's guide, games, quizzes, and more, log on to dakotapathways.org.